painting conservation. Um, I've done a considerable amount of research into artists' use of commercial paints. And today I'm going to talk about the development of the paint industry in the first half of the 20th century. And although to date my research has really focused on decorative household paints for the retail market that have been used by artists, um, today I'm going to talk a bit more about the protection and decoration of public buildings and architecture. Um, and unlike most other speakers here today, I'm more interested in the binding medium of the paint rather than the colour of it. So this is quite an interesting departure for me. So I'm going to outline the main types of paints that were available. Um, and I'll also discuss the relationship between the architect who specified the paints, um, the painter or decorator who applied them, and the paint manufacturer. And I'll discuss the problems that arose sort of while these developments in the paint industry happened um, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, so the 1920s to the 1960s was a period of immense change um, in the paint industry. And during this period, paint manufacture was transformed from a sort of small craft-based industry to a major branch of the chemical industry. And the key developments, the really important developments, were firstly the introduction of ready-mixed paints, and they became widely available in about the 1920s, and then the introduction of paints based on synthetic resins. And concurrent with these developments in paint technology were also the introduction um, of a range of new building materials and techniques um, such as prefabrication, use of concrete, etc. And all of these required specialist protective and decorative coatings. Um, so before the widespread availability of ready-mixed paints in the 1920s, um, the painter would buy his raw materials and he'd hand mix his paints to suit the particular job. And he continued to do this until well into the 1950s, 1960s. Um, and oil-based paints were used for the best quality interior and exterior work and they were used for walls and on woodwork. Um, and in their simplest form, they comprise uh, raw and treated linseed oil, um, lead white paste, turpentine, and dryers. And they could be pigmented as well, tinted with pigments to get the colour. Um, and the painter also um, might add a bit of varnish, which would increase the gloss, the hardness, the drying time of his paint. Um, Water-based paints were also available. The very simplest one is distemper, um, which is amber blue and chalk, which was used for interiors only. It's very friable. And lime wash, which um, I'm sure you're all aware of, which can be used interior and exterior. And then, um, coming on from these very basic water paints, um, a bit later on introduced casein paints, um, and then the very durable, um, washable distempers, which are really oil and water emulsions. So these were the range of traditional paints that were available. Um, and the painter would alter the proportions and the ingredients to suit the climate, the weather conditions, um, the substrate the paint was being applied to. Um, and of course there were also, alongside these sort of retail coatings, were the more industrial coatings. So say if a waterproof coating is required, a bituminous paint might be used. Um, but the most important thing to remember um, is that the architect and the painter both had a very good understanding of the properties of traditional paints. Um, they knew what materials were available, how they should be used correctly, how they might behave. Um, they understood their expected lifetime and also the maintenance schedule. However, as the paint industry grew and the formulation of paints became more complex, um, what happened was the painter no, no longer really understood what was in the materials he was using. And then the development of synthetic resins in the first decades of the 20th century um, divorced him from the materials a little further. Um, and by the mid 20th century, um, synthetic resins had all but replaced natural products in all industrial and retail finishes. And synthetic resins have a number of important properties. Um, the batch-to-batch -batch reproducibility and a consistent quality, of course, is very important, especially if you're a paint manufacturer. It means you can ensure your paint is of a consistent quality and has consistent properties. Fast drying, of course, is another um, a key and a very important uh, property of synthetic resin. And they do this without compromising the lifetime of the film. Um, they usually have better colour, not always, um, but most of, these, most of the synthetic resins we use have better colour. And this is very important because it enabled the formulation of um, white, very pale, very delicate tints of paint, which just isn't achievable, say, with an oil paint, which is going to yellow over time. Um, and there's not enough time, um, and also they're more durable, sorry, the last one. Um, so there's not enough time to go into all the different paints that were available, but I'm going to briefly outline the ones that were used in decorative, sort of, um, decorative paint manufacture. So, um, 
Um, the first semi-synthetic resin to be formulated into a coating was nitrocellulose. Um, it consists of nitrated cellulose with resins, plasticizers, pigments, um, and a mixture of solvents. And it was, they were mainly used for industrial finishes. Um, they're associated mainly with the automobile industry. Um, but from the mid-1920s, they were also formulated into a range of brushing and spraying methods for decorative purposes. Um, now these are, as you can see, an advert from the Knox Duco. These were geared very much towards the home user for small jobs around the house. And their main appeal was that they were incredibly fast drying. Um, but this um, produced a lot of uh, problems in application. Um, they're so fast drying, they're very hard to apply with a brush. And they also remain solvent sensitive, so they're impossible to recoat with a brush because they simply they just dissolve the underlying coat. Um, but they were available as well to the professional decorator in spray form, and they were quite useful coatings for some applications because they're very quick to apply, they're very fast drying, and the film that's produced is very washable, so if you've got a hospital, etc., that needs to be kept very clean, that they were good coatings. However, there were so many problems with them um, that they were really quickly superseded by alternative products and um, their use was really quite limited. Um, the next synthetic resin was um, phenolformaldehyde or phenolic resins. Um, and these were reportedly developed um, due to the competition from the very fast drying nitrocellulose hackers. Um, these were developed in the late 1920s. They comprised phenol and aldehyde um, modified with an oil, and the oil was always tongue oil, which is a very fast drying oil, or a mixture of linseed and tongue. Um, so these were, as I said, were introduced in the late 1920s, and they were used throughout the 1930s for quick, quick drying four hour enamels. Um, they had exceptional water resistance, chemical resistance, so phenolics are still used today for many industrial coatings, marine finishes, etc. Um, but their main problem is they have very poor colour and then as they age they discolour even further so if you want a nice bright white gloss paint they aren't suitable at all. And these paints, phenolic resins, were used for gloss and flat paints for wall and trim, outside and inside. And then the most important, probably, um, synthetic <coughs> resin that's still widely used today are oil modified alkyds. Um, these were first introduced in the early 1930s, but the Second World War severely disrupted the production of all synthetic resins, actually. Um, and they didn't really become widespread until well after the Second World War, so early to mid-1950s we find them. Um, they're, they're modified with an oil to ensure flexibility and brushability. Um, and the early versions, as you can see on this slide, contain linseed oil, but as you're probably aware, linseed yellows when it ages. And so the post-war alkyds, um, different oils were used, paler oils such as soybean, safflower, um, dehydrated castor oil. And although today they're usually associated with gloss finishes for wooden trim, um, when they were introduced they were also used for flat, as flat wall paints and they were emulsified in water as well. Um, so, all, all these oil paints I've described, except for phenolic resins, which are very durable, have a, sig have a significant weakness, which is they're saponified. Um, so they can't be used on new plaster, they're very sensitive to alkalis. Um, so if you want to coat a new plaster, um, you can't use a traditional oil-based paint. Um, you can use a distemper or, or a lime wash, but these coatings, they're not, wash they're not washable, they're not scrubbable, and they're quite difficult to recoat as well. And it wasn't really until synthetic resin emulsions were introduced that this problem was resolved. Um, so emulsion paints based on vinyl monomers, which the, these are the standard water-based paints you use for interior walls, um, were introduced in the late 1940s. Um, they comprise a synthetic polymer suspended in water, and they have a lot of add additives, they're very complex systems, so you have surfactants to keep the polymer suspended, you then need to have anti-foam agents to stop the paint foaming up because of all the surfactants. Um, freeze thaw agents because they're water-based, if they're kept in a cold garage they're going to freeze. Um, Antibacterial agents, etc. So they're very complex, delicate systems. Um, and there are several types of binders that have been used for paint manufacture, so I'll outline them here. Um, the first one to be introduced um, to the US market in the late 1940s was a co-polymer of styrene and butadiene. 
Um, styrene and butadiene were used, and still are used, in the synthetic rubber industry, and the US, after the Second World War, had a vast synthetic rubber industry, and so they made coatings out of these polymers. Um, they're no longer used today because they suffer the same problems as synthetic rubber does in terms of their deterioration. They have very poor colour, they're susceptible to oxidation. Um, I think they're still available for very, very cheap coatings. And the other polymer that was used in the US as well was plasticised polystyrene. And again, that's no longer used today because it has quite a bad, um, it has severe durability problems. So these coatings were the first ones to be introduced. And as I said, they were available primarily in the US because the monomers were available there. Um, emulsion paints based on polyvinyl acetate or PVAC um, developed in Germany in the 1930s. And their use also became widespread in the late 1940s. Um, they're used in the UK and Europe today. They're still the predominant binding media in the UK for standard interior emulsion paints. And they have good colour, etc. They're alkaline resistant. And then the final sort of important one for emulsion paints are acrylic emulsions, which are most commonly known in the form of artist acrylic paints. Um, they were introduced in the mid 1950s. Their use was and still is more prevalent in the US because the acrylate monomer is cheaper and more widely available over there. And acrylic emulsions are much more durable than the PVACs, the styrene butadienes. They have much better colour. Um, and they're used where greater durability is required. So for kitchen and bathroom paint, um, and also for exterior masonry paint that's going to be exposed to the weather. And the, U the US market today, the standard emulsion paint market, comprises a code full of acrylic and PVAC. So as a group, these paints have some excellent properties which really sort of revolutionised the, revolutionise the do-it-yourself sort of decorative paint industry. They were so easy, they're so easy to apply and easy to clean up that suddenly you didn't need to be a professional to use them. Um, they offer good coverage in a single coat, so you can usually one coat coverage. Um, they're non-penetrating, um, so they're suitable as primer sealers. They are moisture permeable, <coughs> excuse me, and alkali resistant, so they can be applied to new and damp plaster, which is important on a building project where the plaster maybe hasn't got time to dry properly before you need to put the coating on. And the very quick drying nature of the binders and their low odour means that they're great for uh, decorating public buildings such as schools, hospitals, hotels. You can decorate the room in the morning and it can be occupied the same afternoon. Um, and this is a huge benefit over traditional oil paints, which take a long time to dry and also have quite a strong odour. And alongside these developments, of course, were the more sort of industrial coatings, such as uh, chlorinated rubber, which is used in, in marine environments, aqueous environments, um, epoxies, etc. But I'm, this isn't really my field of knowledge, so I'm not going to go down there. Um, the important thing to note about all these new paints was that as this range became available, the knowledge and the expertise of the architect and the builder couldn't keep up. And within a few years, they no longer understood what was in the materials they were using and specifying. Um, so although the introduction of these new paints was um, beneficial overall, when they were first introduced, there was a period of adjustment and there were quite a few problems with them. Um, most of these problems were associated with uh, incorrect surface preparation before they were applied, and inappropriate use of them, and I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, so in any architectural project, it's the uh, architect who specifies the paint, um, he passes the specification to the building contractor, the, sorry, the painting contractor, and then the painting contractor sources the paint and applies it to the architect's specifications. So historically this worked quite well. Um, as I said, traditional paints are very simple, the architect understood them, the painter understood them, um, and there were sort of few problems. However, with the introduction of these increasingly <coughs> complex paints and ready mix paints, um, both these parties became ignorant of the properties and behaviours of them. And complicating things further, as I said, was the range of new building materials and techniques. And it, the, only, the problem wasn't just that architects and decorators were unfamiliar with the content <coughs> of new paints. Equally, the manufacturer, the manufacturer making the paints in the factory had no idea of the substrate they were going to be applied to, the weather conditions, um, etc. So both parties were quite divorced from the process. 
And it was also quite common for a painter who was accustomed to hand mixing his materials. If he was having problems with a paint, he might try and add a bit of extra oil. He might add some extra dryers to try and alter the paint's properties and it would just result in unworkable paint because they're quite carefully balanced systems. And most of the problems with ready mixed paints and synthetic paints um, occurred because they were used inappropriately, um, which was often the fault of the painter. And one of the most common complaints that I find in trade journals, decorating magazines, etc., is that the manufacturers refuse to list the ingredients of their paints on the can. And they have a number of good reasons for doing this. But the decorators complain that how could they be sure they were using the materials appropriately if they didn't know what was in the paints? And the manufacturers replied, well, they've got lots of um, new complicated ingredients in there. You wouldn't understand them anyway. All you need to do is follow the specifications that we've written on the can and then they'll, they'll behave, they'll perform well. And it's evident that this wasn't occurring. These specifications weren't always being read. Um, and a major problem, um, one of the major problems with synthetic paints was that great claims were made for them when they were first introduced. So the paint companies had newly, new research and development facilities and also sort of slick um, advertising and marketing departments. And so these new products were advertised as soon as they were advertised and released, as soon as they were developed, um, often without adequate testing. So um, failures became apparent only after several weeks after they were introduced. And then in the belief that these new products were superior to traditional ones, um, architects were initially very keen to specify them. And this especially happened with the emulsion paints. And they specified them for interior use, exterior use, in damp conditions, in freezing conditions, and in other words, far too much was expected of them. Um, and as I said, this was especially true of the synthetic resin emulsions, um, as they are so easy to apply, um, and they do have very good properties if they're used appropriately. But when, when architects and painters were told they have um, excellent adhesion and they'll perform under a wide range of conditions, they took that to mean that they could apply them to any surface under any conditions. And as anyone who has tried to overpaint a ceiling, which has distemper on it already, with an emulsion paint will know, if the surface is slightly dusty or chalky, it simply peels off in the sheets, which is what I can show you here on this slide. And the major problem, the major complaint that I've come across in trade literature um, from professional decorators was the problem with adhesion um, of these synthetic resin emulsions to old surfaces. And they were all caused because the surface wasn't, um, wasn't prepared properly before the coating was applied. And so alongside these developments in paint manufacture were also developments in building manufacture. And as well as difficult surfaces such as concrete, um, which is very alkaline and also very, takes a long time to dry out, techniques such as prefabrication meant that painting became a multi-stage process. Um, so it became quite common for the priming layers to be applied in a factory and then the top coat to be applied later on site. And there are a number of problems with this. Um, whoever's overseeing the whole job has to ensure that the person specifying the after coat paint is working to the same guidelines as the person specifying the top coats. He has to make sure those two layers are compatible. And the main problem is um, if, if building components are hanging around on the building site for several months before they're installed, or they've been allowed to get dirty and dusty before the top coats are applied, the layer of dirt and dust prevents the top coat from sticking and you get problems like this illustrated here with the lack of adhesion between layers. Um, so manufacturers realised that some of the problems were caused by the fact that the specifications for their products weren't being read. So they responded by reformulating the new paints um, so that they would perform under a much wider range of conditions. So they, were, they had a greater degree of latitude. Um, however, these ra very rapid developments meant that just as the specification was settled, everyone understood how a paint worked, how it would perform, the manufacturer would come up with a new product with different properties. And I found quite a few references to architects in the 1950s and 1960s um, wishing that the paint industry would slow down a little bit and enable them to catch up. And uh, throughout the 1950s and 60s, um, in architectural and building trade journals, there are a number of articles um, which are designed to help the architect to navigate his way through the different types of coatings 
um, to outline their advantages, their disadvantages, how they might perform, etc. And by contrast with colour, in the 1950s and 60s, there's no British standards um, assigned to paint, to binders for paint. So there was no way of knowing what was a good quality paint, what was a poor quality, what was in anything. And when, the fa when failure of the coating occurred, it wasn't always clear who should take the blame. Uh, was it the fault of the architect who'd specified that particular coating? Um, was it the painter who'd applied it incorrectly? Or, um, or was it the paint manufacturer who had made um, false claims for his product? And the poor old architect tended to be stuck in the middle of this, wondering what on earth to do, um, to do with the, the extra cost that was involved. And making things even worse was that many of these new paints are actually very durable. Um, they're very difficult to remove. So if there was a catastrophic failure, suddenly removing the paint and replacing it with a different one becomes a very expensive and time-consuming process. And so to finish, um, I thought it would be interesting to look at a case study of how paint is specified. And so we're returning to the Festival of Britain um, and the Festival Hall. And I chose the Festival of Britain, which opened in 1951. Um, firstly, because the construction took place in the late 40s and early 50s, when all these developments in paint technology were being made. Um, and I thought that the coatings used might reflect these, this range of um, products available. And also, during the course of my research, I found a number of um, references to the difficulties they'd had in coating these surfaces, because there were things like asbestos, concrete, um, wet plaster, which are very difficult surfaces to deal with. And finally, of course, I was very aware of Patrick Bates' work in the original colour scheme for the Festival Hall. So, the Festival of Britain opened in the summer of 1951. Um, it was organised by the government, and its purpose was to showcase British developments in industry, technology, arts, etc. And the main site was on London South Bank, um, although there were other associated sites around the UK, um, and the one I'm going to be talking about as well was live architecture in Poplar, East London, and there was also pleasure gardens at Battersea. And the records of the Festival of Britain are held in the National Archives in London, and there are a number of references to the coatings used. And the ones I found included um, simple distemper, washable distemper, colour wash or lime wash, uh, gloss paint, flat oil paint, synthetic resin emulsions, bituminous paints, chlorinated rubber, and a render based on synthetic resins, and other specialist coatings for concrete. And I'm sure there are many other types, these are just the ones that I came across. Um, and colour, and this is a recurring theme of today, um, that colour was an essential component of the festival of buildings. But it isn't always, um, people don't always appreciate this today because of the problem of black and white photography and you see everything in black and white. Um, but very bright primary colours were used for the um, interior and the exterior buildings in the festival. Um, and the colours of the buildings were as carefully conceived as their form, which Patrick demonstrated this morning with the festival hall um, deck of original colour scheme. Um, so in order to ensure that the colours of the exterior buildings in particular coordinated throughout the site, um, the architects were instructed to submit their chosen colours to the Design Council for approval. And then the Design Council had a standard range of 19 colours, uh, plus black and white, which was issued by the British Colour Council. Um, and the report was that most of the architects' requirements could be met <coughs> in these, this standard range of colours. So by the spring of 1950, on the festival site, there was apparently a steady stream of paint representatives on site, and a large selection of samples for interior and exterior use. Um, they were being tested. Um, and the company chosen to provide the exterior paints, certainly, and probably the interior ones as well, was R. Gay & Co., um, which was an associate of Pynchon & Johnson Limited. Um, and interestingly, the architects working on the buildings were instructed to specify the colour and the type of finish only. Um, so they weren't to specify particular brands, they just said pale blue in matte, black glass, white glass, etc. Or green eggshell, that was all they were asked for. Um, and in 19, the spring of 1950, so a year before, um, a year before the uh, exhibition opened, Two paint shops were set up on site where all the colours were mixed to the architect specifications. And I think you can see on this drawing some of the um, colours, the architect's drawings bear this out. If you have a look through them, they've got the colours specified on there, but no types of paint. 
So, um, and in addition to the main festival on the South Bank was the Live Architecture Exhibition in Poplar, which is in East London. And the purpose of this exhibition was to, um, it was building new social housing after the Second World War, and also to showcase, it, showcase the housing. And it's still there, it's the Lansbury Estate, um, you can go and visit it. And some of the buildings were to be completed, um, others were left unfinished, to, so they showed the building process. Um, you can see here on the left is a school half built. Um, and they also had exhibits of buildings. So the um, picture on the left shows an insulation in the cavity wall. And the panel on the right is called Failure in Painting Distemper. So obviously they were aware that the, um, these coatings had quite significant problems, the traditional coatings. However, so what they also had were some show houses, completed um, flats that people could walk through and look around, and these are two images of those. Um, and so even though um, they knew that distemper wasn't very durable, it failed, maybe traditional paints weren't always the best, the specifications for these inexpensive social housing was very simple, um, simple distemper on the walls and the woods painted in um, oil paint. So, um, and it's not really surprising that the cheapest possible coatings were specified for this project. So the festival paints appear to be, have been chosen to suit their purpose and also to suit the budgets. Um, and as, as would be expected, uh, the coatings were treated differently depending on whether their function was decorative or protective. Um, as I said earlier, there were many difficult surfaces to coat. And for these, um, chlorinated rubber, synthetic emulsion paints um, and synthetic enamels proved to be very useful. Um, but the purely decorative paints applied to traditional surfaces and many of the interior finishes um, tended to be traditional paints and mostly comprised distemper and oil paint. And the complex relationship here between the architect, the contractor and the manufacturer that really was, um, that really happened at this period um, was neatly summed up by Jean Simmons. And Simmons was an architectural student whilst the festival hall was being built and she spent 15 months on site. And one of the key things she came away with was that there were so many problems with translating the architect's drawings into reality. And she said most of these weren't caused by bad design on the part of the architect, but by bad detailing, which came from an architect's lack of knowledge about how the work would be carried out in practice. And this also translates into the surface finishes at that time as architects became less knowledgeable about the available materials and how they behaved, the problems and misunderstandings about their correct use increased. And this was exacerbated by the fact that painters were also confused at this time when all these huge developments were being made in the paint industry. Thank you very much.